you allow me, uh, today's uh, se se seminar. Okay, uh, we're gonna talk. Okay, so we did a bit. Okay, let me pin my video. Okay, there we are. So, uh, as you know, this is a two part seminar. So, we actually want to know about spiritual growth. Okay, spiritual growth in the stage of life. So, uh, today we are going into the second uh, seminar, which is dynamics and means of spiritual growth in the spiritual seasons of life. Okay, so we basically want to focus on a few areas like retirement, aging well, dementia, and dying well. Okay, so uh, some, some, some a bit not nice to talk about it. We don't talk about uh, dying well, you know. You say, che, 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 che. We don't talk about that. But it's something that we need to know as Christians. And uh, every, everybody dies. So you cannot escape from that. Okay, so just to recap, as I said, the spiritual formation of spiritual growth is intentional. Okay, so we have to understand that this is an intentional process that we that means we want have to want to grow and we partner with the Holy Spirit to do that. And it's an ongoing process of inner transformation. So it's ongoing all the time, whether we like it or not, whether we are aware of it or not, the spiritual formation process is ongoing. Okay, but the Christian spiritual formation is intentional to become like Jesus Christ, as I said, the first strength, person in spiritual formation, okay, person in formation like Jesus Christ. Second one is to become like with others, a communal people of God. So this is person in community formation. And the third is to become an agent for God's redemptive purpose. And this is person in missions formation. Okay, so here we have the components of it and uh, as we talked uh, as we have spoken okay. uh, somebody please stop taking over my screen <laughs> Okay, sorry about that. My screen has been hijacked. Okay, so here we have the uh, we have covered this just to revise. We talk about the first half and second half of spiritual growth. Okay, so that means in the first half, we actually at birth we have started spiritual formation, and then we proceed all the way to until we die. So in the first half, we talk about development of the false self. And the second half, the development of the true self. Okay, now this is a concept so that we can understand spiritual growth. Okay, and uh, uh, the the point seems to be like Romans seven, where you the old self and the new self, and you struggle with both. Okay, so as we go on, we will expand on that. Okay, and remember uh, what we say about uh, what is spiritual formation, spiritual growth. Okay, it's not uh, uh, growing from a seed. Okay, God has created us. God has created us perfect. Okay, so this we will re uh, receive this perfection when we receive our resurrected self. Okay, that is our true self. And our true self is like a sculptor that you see is in this block of. Uh, Okay, that is in this marble block that you can see the David inside. So the process of spiritual growth or spiritual formation is for us to chip away all the layers until the statue comes out, until our real self come out. 
Okay, and it's an ongoing process because as we start chipping away, then uh, more dirt uh, come and cover the thing. And so we keep on have to chip, 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 chip. And that is the process of uh, switcher growth, switcher formation. <coughs> so it's an ongoing process of chipping away until the real self come out. And that is switcher formation. Okay. And uh, our uh, text is actually 2 Corinthians 3.18. Okay. Remember, and we who with unreal faces all reflect the Lord's glory are being transformed into His likeness. Okay? We are being transformed into the likeness of God with ever-increasing glory. So it's a process of becoming, being transformed into glory of God, which comes from the Lord who is the Spirit. So it's an ongoing process that goes on. Yeah. So the journey isn't so much about becoming anything. And we always think that uh, you know, if we do become something, then I will be a better Christian. You know, I'll be a more major Christian. If I do this, I do this. I attend church. I tie how many percent. And I do this, then I'm a perfect Christian. No. It's not so much about becoming anything. Maybe it's about unbecoming. Everything that really isn't you. So spiritual growth is actually becoming who you really God created you to be who you really are, so that you can be who you are meant to be in the first place. So that is what spiritual growth is about. Okay, so it's an individual and community transformed to Christ's likeness. It's an ongoing process. The Holy Spirit is involved and God's glory is restored. Okay, so you see that it's actually two half of our whole life. Okay, and uh, we all journey through this. Okay, we start with uh, physical, emotional growth. We start our career, get married, have children, uh, acquire wealth, status, and power. And then as we grow older, okay, and all of us will grow old, no matter how much you wish, then we will encounter physical pain. Now, pain becomes a, a part of our life. Okay. Now, just because we are Christian doesn't mean that we don't undergo suffering. Yeah, sometimes as you grow older, you find that your joints aches a bit, you know, and then when you wake up in the morning, you got to check, make sure every part is working. And then we are prone to anxiety and depression. Okay, even Christians are prone to anxiety and depression. Uh, grief and loss, especially as you grow older, we begin to lose our loved one. Loneliness and happiness. And why is very important is that one thing we must acknowledge that how do we live with limitations? Yeah, as we grow older, we cannot do the things that we used to be able to do. That's why I always tell people, you know, travel when you're young. Travel when you can and still walk. Don't wait until you cannot walk, then you start traveling. And a lot of places are not wheelchair friendly. So, so living with limitations. And that is the second half of life. First half of life, you know, you are so young and strong, you can basically think that you live forever. Second part of life, you begin to come to terms with what is the important part of life. What is the one thing needful? That, uh, okay. So it's a process of uh, moving from the false self to the true self. Okay. Uh, you know, so, so I believe I sent you the PowerPoint. If you have not received the PowerPoint for the first se session, please contact uh, Pastor Adeline. Okay, so basically, it's moving from the false self that we build up. And it's not wrong. All of us go develop a false self. Okay, but it's wrong if we stick to the false self. Okay, the process of spiritual formation or spiritual growth is to move from the false self into our true self to become who God created us to be. And that is our focus today to become who God be, wants us to be, dealing mainly with retirement, dementia, and dying well. It's an end. We are dealing with mainly with the later seasons of life. Okay? I mean, uh, six, uh, three score and ten, that's about 70 years. We strength, 80 years. So we are talking about uh, how many more years do you have? 
Okay, how many more years do you have to be effective? Okay, I'm 65. So I think, well, maybe I would have about 15 more years. Okay, 10 more active years. Okay, then I can actually move around, maybe the five years. And then, uh, but nowadays we zoom and all that is helpful. Okay, but after 10 years, from the next uh, five years, we'll be likely to have struggle with illnesses, uh, heart attacks and all this, cancer and all this. So, so it, that is the process of life. So you have to ask yourself a very, very, uh, very serious question. How many years do you have left? And what are you going to do with these years that you have left? So that is a very serious question. Are you listening? Okay. Oh, and uh, Romans <laughs> talked about uh, the process of growth. That his inner being, I delight in God's law. Okay, But there's another law. That means the false self and the true self. So we have to move towards the true self. Okay, so uh, spiritual uh, aging as a spiritual discipline. So we, we, we have to accept aging as part of life. Okay. This is uh, from another lecture, not given by me, but uh, the note taking was wonderful, so I thought it was very nice. Okay. So we, aging is part of life, and aging is a spiritual discipline. And we need to know how to age well, because that is part of the thing. So the, the first thing we'll consider uh, this morning is retirement. Okay, so what about retirement? Does the Bible talk about retirement? Yes, it does. Okay, Numbers chapter 8. Okay, verse 23, 26. Talks about the, and the Lord said to Moses, this applies to the Levites. Okay, the Levites are the ones who take care of the ten of meetings, the tabernacle. Men 25 years or more shall take part in the work at the ten of meeting. But at age of 50, they must retire from their regular service. So the Bible does talk about retirement. So those 50 years old retire, okay? So that means they no longer take part in building the tabernacle, but they must assist their brothers in performing their duties at 10 of making, a 10 of meeting. Okay? But they themselves must not do the work. So there is a basis behind this. Because you find that the 10 of making a ten of meeting or tabernacle is it makes out a lot of poles. It's a portable temple, so there are a lot of poles and uh, paneling and all that. So it's okay for young people, okay, twenty five years and all these young strong men can carry. You know, because every time the the the, the pillar of light move, then they all move. So they have to quickly tear down and then put it up again. Okay, when uh, light stops. So it takes a lot of work, a lot of energy. Maybe 25 years old people, uh, young fellows can, but maybe 50 years old, not so good, not so strong, not as strong as they used to be. So it makes sense that then they are more of a guard. They, they guard this from uh, people who destroyed it and it becomes secret uh, protection. So there is a, a basis behind this. And it shows that, yes, there's a time where we have to be aware that, yes, we grow older. We are not as strong as we used to be. So we need to accept this is our, our stage of life and what we want to do about it. So that is where retirement comes in. Okay. Now, retirement is not something terrible. It's like people look at it and say, oh, your retirement is so terrible. Okay, but I, I believe that actually retirement is, is a, 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 a good thing in the sense that it's a stop point for us to review. Okay, for us who have been working for maybe 40 years, okay, or 50 years, okay, and then we need to uh, ask ourselves, we need to have a point and say, okay, what are we going to do for now? Okay, so retirement is a point where we can have to our force to stop and think. What, what is important in our life? What do we do? Okay. 
I mean, why we retire? It can be compulsory. Okay, compulsory retirement is that when you reach a certain age, okay, and they say, okay, uh, you're 50, 55, 60, then you stop work, you retire. So that one is compulsory retirement. Okay, so you have no choice. So not much decision to make. Your only decision is what you do after retirement. Some of us retire because of health reasons. Because we are not strong, we are weak, and then we retire. It's fair enough. I mean, uh, that's a reason. Some have an option that we want to retire or not. So retirement is a time that we need to discern, pray, and plan. Okay, We want to plan for what are we going to do. Okay, Not all of us are going to get a golden parachute. So it's a, uh, retirement is a stop point for review. So what do you want to do when you reach the retirement age? Okay, so you listen. You pray with the Lord, you know, and you pray with your friends, and you pray with, uh, uh, and then you seek the Lord. Okay, what will you do after retirement? Now there, are, there are some people who like to continue to work. So if you do, go ahead. Okay, if you can continue to start, continue working. The, the same way you've been doing, there's no harm. You can continue working after retirement. Okay. I mean, it depends on how you feel about your job. Uh, if you feel you want to get up in the morning and you're excited to get up in the morning and say, I want to go to work. Okay. Then by all means, continue to work. But if you are feeling that Oh, I don't want to get up in the morning. I hate going to work. Okay, on Monday you ask, oh, is it a Friday already? Then maybe you should think about stopping work. Okay, because you have worked so many years, it's time to do something else. So retirement is where you stop to consider. You really like to work or not? Can you see the rest of your life? Whatever life that you have left, you can give a portion of it to work or you want to do something else. So, so something for us to think about discernment, planning, and planning. You need to work. Some of us do need to work because we have uh, bills to pay and we uh, need to pay mortgage and all that. Okay, so some of us are for, have to continue working to, so that we don't starve. So that is a reason to continue working. Now, some of us have the option to consider to modify the work we do. Maybe instead of uh, working full time, you can work part time, or you can uh, take a lighter workload, a desk job. So, if you want to continue to work, fair enough. Maybe see whether you want to do it. How do you modify it? Okay. Some of us want to change work. I want to stop uh, work. Fair enough. And then you're, it's okay to stop work and enjoy yourself. Okay, you, you uh, build up, uh, uh, have enough money to go on holiday, play golf every day. There's nothing wrong with that. Okay. Yeah, it's just that, uh, well, make, make sure that uh, you enjoy it. You don't do it for the sake of doing it. You don't do it for the sake of uh, using up your time. Yeah, a lot of people who stop work and then they find that they have so much time on their hand, they don't know what to do with the time. So they keep on playing golf and go, keep on taking holidays after holiday after holiday. And after a while, it's very sien. I mean, it's how many golf games can you play? How many uh, uh, holidays can you take before it becomes meaningless? Okay. So when you stop work, Okay, what are you going to replace it with? Yeah. Stopping work doesn't mean that you don't do anything. Yeah. I, I, I see a lot of people which is sad. When they stop work, they are just waiting to die. And I don't think that is what a Christian life is. It's not waiting to die. It's not that we embrace, we must uh, live. But then if you stop, you just wait. To die, then you're just wasting these years of life. Yeah. And then 
uh, some of us talk about changing to other work. Okay, changing to other work. How, how we want to do something else, which is good. If you have anything planned, then you must plan to change what you want to do. Okay. And usually is that if you want to do volunteer work, a lot of us think that, oh, when we retire, we want to spend our time doing volunteer work. Now, if before you retire, you don't do volunteer work, after you retire, it's unlikely that you do volunteer work. Okay, it must be something that you have a passion for. You cannot force yourself to do volunteer work. It, it won't last. So that is where retirement is a top point for us to review. Okay, you know, uh, this mask man, I, uh, I, I have been trained and I've been a pediatrician and all this for about 40 years. Okay? And, and I felt that early in my career, I wanted to uh, go into ministry. Okay, so I asked the Lord, Lord, can I, can I go full time? The Lord said, no. Next year, I asked him again, can I go full time or not? He says, no. So I continue uh, doing all this. And, and it, 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 it is uh, beneficial. People get blessed. People get healed of the disease. I meet a need. I mean, it's a fantastic job to be a doctor. You actually save people's life. But I always wanted to do full time. So uh, while doing this, I get involved in uh, teaching, in uh, ministry and all that. And I thought, okay, when I retire, I will go into full time. Okay, so, uh, so the retirement age, I always set the target when I retire. Is it? So initially, the retirement age was 50. So when I reached 50, I said, oh, Lord, it's time already. Okay. Then they moved the retirement age to 55. Okay, so, so I look a lot. What, what are you trying to do? Okay, then when I reach 55, they moved the retirement age to 60. And then when I reach 65, 60, it moved the retirement to 65. So it's like, Lord, why are you moving the goalposts for me? Okay. But in the meantime, when I was about 40, I decided if I want to be involved in ministry, I need to get myself prepared. So that means about when I was 40, okay, I took up a theological training. I actually went to MBS and did a Master of Ministry. Actually, Master of Ministry is actually for pastors. But for somehow, you know, the, uh, MBS allowed me to do it because of my uh, uh, helping the church and all that. So I did a Master of Ministry while working as a pediatrician. Okay, over two years. I got the, the degree, and then I continued to serve in church. And I, I began to discover that as I get more involved, that I want to teach in the seminaries. So, so I need to, I want to get a PhD. So at that time, the retirement age was 55. So I said, okay, if I get my PhD in, when I'm 55, okay, that'll be just nice. So I started my PhD work at 50. And I got my PhD in uh, spiritual formation when I'm 55. And this is part-time. I'm still full-time pediatrician. But the retirement age moved from 55 to 65. So I'm not over here yet. Okay, Even though I'm, now I'm doing both. I'm doing both. I, I have not moved over to uh, uh, full-time ministry yet. Yeah, because I want to spend the, the rest of my, the, my 10 years of active service left in uh, full-time ministry. In, uh, what? Okay. But the Lord seems to have idea, other ideas. Now, now I'm 65. Okay. I finally reached 65. I said, yeah, now I can retire. Then the hospital offered me another two-year contract. Yeah. So maybe 67. You know, two years time, you ask me whether I, I've gone full-time or not. So, so you see, retirement is a choice, but we have to make a decision. We have to make the decision because retirement is actually linked to aging well, and it's linked to work. 
And work is a very important part of our life. Okay? Whether we like it or not, we spend almost half of our adult life working. So do we so when we talk about retirement, do we talk about okay, you want to continue working or part-time or change to another area of work? So if you want to think that you want to do another area of work, then you need to get training early before you retire so that you can shift to another area of work. Okay, another type of work okay, that you will want to do. You want to spend the rest of your time with. The, the, and uh, in this area of aging well, you must realize that we have a lot of freedom now. Okay? Our, well, by now, hopefully, all our debts are paid off. That means you have paid off your car, your house. Okay? Please don't buy a new house, bigger house. Okay? You can buy, buy a condo. So you, okay? you, we tend to go downwards. Okay? What uh, Henry Nowen called downward mobility. So instead of uh, when we're young, we tend to buy bigger house, bigger cars and all that. We tend to buy smaller house, smaller cars. And maybe a house and a condo. So we have the freedom now. Okay, because our children have grown up. Hopefully, they, are, uh, have, they are, have their tertiary education. They are, have their jobs. So they can look after themselves. Okay, our uh, finances are hopefully quite stable. Okay, and then uh, our uh, mortgage, we don't own anything to the bank. Okay, so, so there is a freedom that we can actually do what we want to do. Okay. There's actually a, a freedom for us to choose okay, as we grow older what we want to do. Okay. Now, one of my hope is that I would become a missionary. Okay? But missionary, doctor, stroke, uh, pediatrician to one of the poorer countries, poorer areas. Because, I, because I'm a pediatrician, and an uh, uh, associate professor, I can actually get in easier. So that's what I want to do. A friend of mine, she's now 76. From, she's in Australia. And she spent six months in Australia and six months in Kenya running a, a children's home. Because that is a passion. She used, before that, before she retired, she was a pastor. So there is a freedom to, to move now more than before. Before we have, when we are younger, we have responsibility to our family, our, our spouse and our job. But nowadays, as we age well, we have the freedom. Let's use that freedom. I think it's important that we need to uh, use that freedom well. Then friends. Okay. I always say that uh, it's good to have friends, yes. But you must have real friends. And part of aging well is that you have a friends, I always call them friends to die with. Okay? Friends to die with. Because you want to get a group of friends that are almost your age so that you can spend together and then as you grow old together, so that you can die, die with, not die together, but die with. So it's good to build up friends and uh, friends take time and a lot of energy to, to be maintain and develop friendship. So that should be our part of our focus. Another thing that we want to focus on as we uh, age well is that the community, maybe our faith community, how can we contribute? Now, it's sad that uh, in our churches nowadays, there are not many options available for the senior citizen. Maybe a senior citizen fellowship, but no, no uh, real stuff uh, uh, for them. No real role. But it doesn't matter. What we can do is that we can uh, uh, go alongside younger people, either to mentor them, to be their friend, or we can be godparents. Okay, we have the time to help, to 
to look after young family, young couples with children and have to look after their children. Now, babysitting is not that bad a, a, a mission field you know, because you get to look after other people's children. So you must have friends and then you have, must have community. And then what is, we must have focus too. Otherwise, uh, every day you get up in the morning, read the newspaper, after that is lunchtime, and you wonder what is for dinner. And the problem is that if you have uh, no real focus, you will focus on your aches and pain. And then you keep complaining to each other about the pain here, pain there, and uh, no, all, all the limitations you have. So you need to have a focus. Okay. Uh, you need to focus of uh, what spiritual legacy are you leaving behind? What have you done? Okay. Or what will you do in the years that you're remaining? And I want to talk about those four movements of the Holy Spirit. Okay. The, the four movements of the Holy Spirit of aging well is from doing to be to being. Okay. That means in the last years of our life, we have to move from doing to being. Okay. We have been doing a lot. Okay, a lot of activities. And that is good. It's helpful in a church. But we also need to become to, to being who we really are. Who is who our real self is. That is becoming. Okay. So becoming our real self. And, and uh, growing old, aging well, teaches very well the process of doing to being. When we become, uh, begin to realize that uh, we cannot do as much as we used to. We tire, we tire out easily. We need more recovery time. Okay, a good friend of mine, Ton, uh, Tony Osfor, uh, in UK, he, he used to come over here to lead a retreat, but he uh, was infected with COVID nineteen, so he was in the ICU, and then he just recovered, so he was he survived. But it, he was reflecting on doing and being that he has been so used to doing. But in the process of being infected with COVID-19, he couldn't do anything. He couldn't even pray. But he felt that that is being the process of becoming. Okay. You know, it's like uh, Leo 10.42, Mary and Martha. Okay, so Mary has the best part, Jesus says. The second movement is from servant to friend. Okay, and it's always triggered by our longing for God. And we end up in intimacy. Okay, Jesus says to the disciples, I don't call you servant, I call you friends. Why I call you friends? Because friends know what the master is going to do. Servant don't. Okay. So when we are young, we want to serve God. We are servants of God. But as we grow older, we become friends of God, God's friend. And we're going to develop a, a strong intimacy with God. And I think that is a movement in the last years of life. That you want to be intimate with God. You want to know God very well. You want to know who is the true God. What God is really like. Not what people tell us. Not what some theology book says. But a personal encounter with the real God. Okay? The third uh, movement is from the false self to the true self. And we're going to realize as we reflect on our life at the beginning and middle stage of our second half, that we actually is a failure in many things. 
no matter how rich you are, how how fat is your bank account, how famous you are, in a way you are failure as a person until you begin to accept your true self. Until you can be who you are. It means what you are inside is what people see in you. Be authentic. So the process of growing old, aging well, is a process of being an authentic person. No need to put on shows, no need to lie to people, no need to put on a mask of personal. Just be who you are. And it's not easy. And then, from knowing to not knowing. Okay. What do we mean by that? Knowing and not knowing. Okay. When we are young, we think we know everything. We, we want to know everything. Okay. We want to know whether things will happen this way or not. We have five years plan, ten years plan. What are we going to do? Okay. But we find that in life, we actually don't know many things. Okay, so if we can live with the fact that we do not know everything and we do not have to know everything, that is spiritual maturity. Because God is a mystery. We can never understand God. We can understand why He allows certain things to happen and certain things not to happen. So if we can live with knowing and not knowing, which basically we trust in God. If we trust in God, we don't have to know what is happening, what is going to be in the future. We don't have to worry because God, we know who God is. So as we, the four movement going, as we grow old in aging well, is from doing to being, from friend, servant to friend, from a false self to a true self, and knowing to not knowing. Okay, so that is the four movement as we grow older. That's a, that should be our focus. Okay. So how do we achieve this um, four movement? Okay. Well, the way to do it is to have spiritual disciplines. Okay. Spiritual disciplines are habits to holiness. Okay. Spiritual discipline is some of the things that we do. And we do it repeatedly. So it becomes a habit. Okay. So when it becomes a habit, then it, it automatically goes on in us. Okay. This is a good book to read, which is Foster, called Celebration of Discipline. It talks about different types of spiritual uh, discipline. The inward discipline, the outward discipline, and the corporate discipline. So the inward dis discipline means, uh, includes meditation, prayer, fasting and study. The outward discipline is simplicity, solitude, submission and service. Okay, The outward means towards God and the inward is towards the person. And the, and the corporate discipline, to do it together, confession, worship, guidance and celebration. So these are worthwhile discipline to do. Okay. But this is only a few of the spiritual discipline or spiritual habits. There are actually thousands of spiritual discipline and spiritual habits that we can practice. Okay? I always love to, to remind people that we have 2,000 years of Christian history, 2,000 years of Christian heritage. And, and don't, don't say, oh, they are all Roman Catholics. They are not. Okay? For the first thousand years there's only one church no roman catholic no orthodox no protestant just one church then after, after uh, 100 uh, ad 113 uh, uh, ad they split the orthodox church and the roman catholic church so the catholic the orthodox church will be more in uh, 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 Russia, Greece, the uh, Roman Catholic Church is the Latin speaking church in Rome. And the Roman Church has been in uh, existence for a thousand years. 500 years ago, the Protestants split. So that means for the last 2000 years, a lot of things that happen are not, doesn't belong to the Catholics, the Roman Catholics. 
doesn't belong orthodox. It belongs to the church. And we need to revive some of the discipline, some of the things that we can use to help us to grow. So what are some of the dis uh, spiritual discipline that will help us to grow? I, I would suggest a few. Okay, and uh, in this uh, session, and I will just highlight five of them. The spiritual discipline of naming our fears. The spiritual discipline of gratitude. Prayer. Lifelong learning and soul care. Okay. And this, remember, this is just a few. There are hundreds of, hundreds of uh, spiritual discipline. But I find that this will be useful for us as we consider aging well. Okay. The spiritual discipline of naming our fear. I'm sure you realize, we, you agree that fear is actually very common among all of us. In fact, all of us actually live in fear. Okay. Fear of uh, what will happen to us, fear of uh, what is, uh, our present condition, fear of losing things, fears of a lot of their fear. And fear is the number one emotion in the world. But as fear, we tend to suppress it. And when we suppress something, it comes out in a different form. It comes out as anxiety. And it comes out as anger. That's why you see, our society is a very anxious society. Okay? The, the anti anxiolytic drugs, and anti-anxiety drugs is the number one uh, bestseller drugs in the world. Because we are also anxious, so we take medication. And we are also angry. That's why, you know, you just take a little thing and then we boom, explode. Because underneath this anxiety and uh, fear and uh, uh, anger is fear. And fear is something that we need to deal with if we are to grow towards our true self. So we so the, this discipline is that we have to name our fear. That means we identify what are our fears. What exactly am I afraid of? Is it loss of safety and security? Is that your fear? Yeah, because now, after the uh, reopening, times are bad. So crime will increase. So are you fearful of going out of the house? Are you fearful of uh, 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 driving because there are a lot of drunken drivers around? Loss of status, fear of loss of status, especially in retirement. Before that, you are the CEO, so you have the key to the executive toilet, you have your own parking space. The moment you retire, nobody knows you. So there's a big jump you know, in the status. Even the security guard won't let you in. So do you fear the loss of this status? Powerless and helpless. I think that is a very important fear that we have. Especially as we grow older, we find that we have less power and less control over our lives. And worse is that if you are admitted to a hospital. In the hospital, the first thing they do is to take, strip your clothes off and give you a hospital gown, which is actually always open at the, uh, behind. And then you become a number. So there is, in the hospital, you have totally given your control and your power over to the doctors and the nurses and the healthcare providers. So are you fearful of that? Fear of loss of loved ones. So you, you're, uh, as you grow older, you know, and then you are uh, more diseases, Fear of being alone, left alone, and fear of death. So we have to name our fear. We cannot let our fear overcome us. Because if our fear overcome us, then we live in bondage to this fear. So in this spiritual discipline, we learn to name our fears and we make friends with our fear. We say to our fear, hello. 
you are my fear. Yeah. In Deuteronomy 31.6, be strong and courageous. Do not fear or be in dread of them. Okay, that means do not live in fear. For it's the Lord your God who goes with you. He will not leave you or forsake you. So do not feed your fears. It's important to realize that we, as we name our fear, as we get to know our fear, things that we need to ask ourselves is that, is our fear real or imagined? Okay. Is it real fear or is it imaginary fear? And you'd be surprised to see, uh, discover that a lot of our fear are imaginary. That we make up in our mind. What if this happened? What if this happened? What if this happened? And become so frightened. And if we identify, oh, this is not real. Uh, this is only imaginary. So we can laugh at that and it will disappear. So do not be in bondage by imaginary fear. And then the second question you want to ask is that, are you in control of your fear or not? Okay. So if, in, say for example, in this situation, you can control and you can act in this situation. And that's good. The situation mastery. That means you can do something that is within your control. But if the situation, the cause of your fear is something that you can't control, you can do something about it, but you can't control. Then it becomes ceaseless striving. That means you're just running around doing something which is not under your control. Okay? So you are like a, a hamster on a treadmill, running, 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 going nowhere. Just wearing yourself out and getting more and more fearful. Or you can be in a situation where you can have some control, but you cannot act. So, for example, like you, your children go overseas okay, to study. Okay. Now, you, you can control, you can tell them which university to go, tell them don't go out at night and all that. But you can't control that. You can't do anything about that. They are on their own. So, you WhatsApp them and you uh, uh, Skype them and you Zoom them. But you, you still cannot control. So, what you can do is give up. Giving up is not giving up, don't do anything but give up to God. Let God take care of it. You cannot do anything about it. You know? the, your children, for example, of your children, they live their own life. They make their own choices. You cannot do anything, but you can give it up to God. So giving up is not giving up, not doing anything, but giving up to God. But in situation you can't control and you can't act, then you need to let go. Okay? Yeah, you need to let go and let God do take care of it. So you find, ask yourself, your, all your fears, where are they? Which situation are they? Which, are they in control or not? Okay. So in things you can do, do it. If you can't do it, let God do it. So your response is that if your fear is imaginary, you say it's not real lah. Okay, and go away. But if you are, uh, your fear is in situation, you can do something, do something. If not, let go and let God. And it's only in this two areas of letting go and letting God is that you do not want to dwell on it. Don't go there. Lah. Because you can, you can ruminate in your mind. Okay, uh, what happened, what happened, what happened? Then it becomes imaginary fear. Or you can uh, stay in your mind, you know, you say, oh, God, take over, but you still have this fear. God, take over your fear. So, so when you want to, don't go there. Don't think about that. Don't, don't, don't go into that area of thinking. Avoid that. So that will break the bondage of fear. That will uh, take our life. That will take over our life as we age especially. When we begin to lose more control over things, there are more areas that we cannot control. So naming our fear is a path to our true or authentic self because we learn to depend on God. That's why Paul, in writing the Philippians, says, you know, brothers and sisters, finally, after all the things he says, finally, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, 
What is pure? What is lovely? What is admirable? If anything is excellent and praiseworthy, think about such things. Okay, that means you focus on what is God giving you. So that's the discipline of naming our fear. The other second discipline I want to encourage you uh, in the second, uh, in the late seasons of life is the special discipline of gratitude. Learn to be grateful for what God has done for you. That's why, you know, we talk about the uh, examination in the uh, early uh, stage of life and the middle, uh, second half. So start the gratitude journal. Okay, start journaling all the things that you are being grateful for. Okay, do a timeline. Timeline is actually break your life into periods of seven years and see what are the things that God has done for you. What are the things to be grateful for? You, you can start the gratitude scrapbook. That means you can have a file and you put in all the photos and all the things that you are uh, grateful for. And the top 10 things to be grateful. You know, when you have time, sit down and list out the top 10 things that you're grateful for in your life. And review that every year. So it, the spiritual discipline of gratitude is that we need to live a life of gratitude, of being grateful. Especially in this, uh, as we grow older, as aging, we must be grateful. And they actually, the people have done studies on gratitude. And they find that being grateful increases our spiritual awareness, which is good. Because the more you are grateful, the more you are aware that God is working in your life and God is there for you. People who are grateful actually are more healthy. And they maximize positive experience. So I mean, if you have a positive experience, it is better because you're grateful. And if you have a negative experience, it's not too bad because you're grateful. And it strengthens the relationship. I think one of the uh, uh, key support for any relationship is to be grateful that you have a relationship. Grateful for the person that you're having a relationship for. Grateful to God for giving you the relationship. So that's the, the spiritual discipline of gratitude. Okay. Then, number three, the spiritual discipline of prayer. Okay. Now, I think, uh, now we cannot hold hands and all that, but I think prayer is very important. Okay. You know, sometimes, uh, I mean, one of the things that uh, some always share with me who was recently in a ICU and he says that I can't do anything Except pray. Okay. Sometimes the the uh, no, we are in such a state that only thing is pray. And sometimes we don't know what words to say. So we let the pray the spirit pray for us. Okay. So the spiritual discipline of prayer is something that we can develop as we grow older. Okay. I want to draw your attention to the different types of prayer. And you find that you know, the presence of God okay, are attentive to an absent God. Okay, God. Well, we cannot see God. That's why it's called absent God. But we know that He is there. Okay, so we are paying attention to attentive God or aware of an unknowable God. God is so far beyond our human understanding that we cannot, there's no way our finite mind can understand God. Okay, so there are these two sides of this diagram. Then using our mind, mentally thinking about God, and using our heart, emotionally loving God. So there are actually four categories of uh, prayer. Okay. We are very used to verbal prayer. Okay. We speak to God. Okay. We use words. That's verbal prayer. Okay. Meditative prayer okay, depends on our mind and also our heart. That means we meditate on certain words and or and then as, as we pray, we say meditative prayer. Okay. Then over the God that we cannot know, the contemplative prayer. Okay. Contemplative prayer is a very important part 
and are very widely used for the last 2,000 years until uh, the until Reformation. Okay. And more, more used in the Catholic Church and Orthodox Church, but less so. But it, I'm happy to know that more and more uh, uh, Protestants are beginning to learn about contemplative prayer. It's silent prayer. You don't have to use words, but you can feel the presence of God. Okay. And God doesn't need to, you to say things because God knows what's in your mind. But just to feel the presence of God. Then you have aesthetic prayer. Prayer that you have a powerful presence of God, infusion of God or grace in your life. So it's good to know that there are different types of prayer and good to learn the, how do we pray different types of prayer. Okay? Because we are limited to only verbal prayer. And there are so much more we can learn about other types of prayer. So let's spend the rest of our life learning how to pray the different types of prayer. Meditative prayer, contemplative prayer, and aesthetic prayer. Okay? One, one way of praying of a, a contemplative prayer is a centering prayer, where you choose a word, and then you sit down, relax, and then you focus on the word. Okay? I won't lead you through it, but if you want, we can actually uh, have sessions on that. Okay? Sometimes uh, prayer tools are important. You can use written prayer, okay? something to remind us to pray. We can use uh, prayer books, okay? and prayer beads and holding cross. Okay? Now, this is from an Anglican uh, bishop. So don't say, oh, this is a prayer bead. No, this is Roman Catholic and this is Orthodox. No, this is Anglican. Okay. And uh, this one is a, a holding cross. Okay. It's, it's a, a, a cross that people hold when they pray. Okay. And, uh, you, and uh, from uh, this, this uh, bishop told me that you know, when he go uh, visit the sick, the person may be un, uh, in a coma or anything, but when they put the, the, this holding cross for them to hold on their hand, they actually reflectively grasp the cross. So these are means okay, of prayer, different prayer. Okay? Uh, prayer box. One way of uh, uh, being grateful is to learn how to pray. And Lamet in her book, Help, Thanks and wow, it says basically there are three types of prayer, only three types of prayer. The prayer of help. Every time we're in trouble, we say help. Prayer of thanks. Thank you, Lord. Wow, that's so great. Oh, wow. Okay, so, so that is basically prayer. Help or thanks or wow. Okay, so you can start a prayer box like this. What I do was that. Every time I have a prayer, I write on a piece of paper and drop it in. Every time the prayer answered, I take it out. Okay. And, and I find that, to my surprise, the box is almost always empty. I, know, I would expect it to get all filled up. Really. And, and that taught me the lesson that God has been answering my prayer all this time. I just take it for granted. So you can start uh, a prayer box, drop box, okay? Uh, this is my dental frost box, so you can use any box. It doesn't matter. Okay. Now, this is a Jesus prayer. Jesus prayer is repeating about Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Yeah, this uh, uh, very uh, commonly used by the uh, Greek Orthodox Church and the Roman Catholic Church. Okay. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. But you repeat it again and again and again. Very useful when you do not know what to pray. Okay. Sometimes there are things that you, you are uh, uh, sitting down there and you want to pray and you, you do not know what to say. So you just repeat it. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Now, this is not vain repetition, eh? Okay, because here you can see that the first part about Jesus Christ, Son of the Living God, is the 
Christological hymn of Philippians 2, 6, 11. So we proclaim that Lord Jesus Christ, you are the son of the living God. And then the second part, have mercy on me, a sinner, where you proclaim that you are a sinner. So I think that is something uh, we need to focus on. That's something that we can learn to pray. Okay, the Jesus prayer is a prayer of the heart. That initially, they say that when you first, you pray the Jesus prayer. Okay, you keep on repeating Jesus prayer. Because it's not vain repetition, it's proclaiming that Jesus is Christ and you are a sinner. Okay, but if you keep on praying it, repeating, 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 you find that the prayer begins to pray you. Okay, it's always being like a uh, 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 lover being aware, constantly aware of the loved one. God, you are constantly aware of God. So that is a Jesus prayer. And body prayer. Okay, even exercise is a form of prayer. Mm-hmm. I mean, God is uh, incarnate in a human body. So why can't we you, uh, use the human body to pray? So you can pray when you're swimming, when you're walking, when you're lying, uh, lying, lying dancing, praise dance, sit down exercise. For those who are on wheelchair, you can actually do exercise when you're sitting down. Okay. The important thing is that as we grow older, we must keep moving. Okay, there's a tendency for us to stop moving as our muscle mass decrease and become weaker. Okay, we must be mobile. So the spiritual discipline of prayer includes using our body. Okay, and then fourth, the spiritual discipline of lifelong learning. Okay. People say that you know, as you grow older, you cannot learn. Well, not that true, actually. I mean, I finished my PhD at 55. So, I mean, not that I, I'm a good example, but yeah, we can still do it. Okay? We, the lifelong learning. Okay. Parker Palmer, I think some of you may have heard of him, The Courage to Teach. Okay? He's a very uh, well-known educator. And he, he always, he wrote this I always expire to live as a learner. The question, what's life trying to teach me about myself and my world? Has helped me find meaning amidst the madness and tragedy in personal, professional, and political life. Okay. Those of you know him, that he's an educator, he's an activist, and he went through three bouts of depression. Okay. And uh, he's in a late stage of life, but he is still healthy and he still writes regularly. So, you know, we, are, we always have to continue learning and there, we have to learn different things, different ways, try out new things. The Lectio Divina, spiritual reading, we consists of uh, reading or listening, Lectio, meditating, Metatio, praying, oratio, and contemplation. Contemplatio. Okay, if you want to know about this, just go on the net and uh, uh, YouTube, or you can subscribe to my uh, channel, Alex Tang in YouTube. Okay, uh, teach you about uh, Lectio Divina. And the fourth uh, dis- discipline I want to talk about aging well is a spiritual discipline of soul care. You find that soul, soul care is actually a big uh, continuum. Okay, you have spiritual friendship where you become friend with somebody as you friend each other. You talk about God, you help each other. Coach is a, a, a person who helps a spiritual uh, leader okay? in, the, in uh, running a church or running a ministry. Okay? You have disciple, disciple making. Where you a uh, more mature Christian help uh, uh, a young, a new uh, young Christian 
to become a disciple of Jesus Christ. Okay, pastoral care, mentoring, spiritual direction, okay? and grandparenting. So you see that there is always place for us to help in a church, to help to take care of people's soul or soul care. So it's a continuum. You can be any time. Okay, you if you have the your experience of uh, you can be a coach, or you can be a mentor, or you can give pastoral care, or even just provide future friendship. That will help to in the time as you grow older to, to, to serve. And I will tell you that a grandparenting is a ministry. Okay? These are my two grandchildren. Okay? You people always say, oh, we don't want to take care of grandchildren. Yeah, that's true. But then this is an opportunity to influence your life. And they always say that the first seven years of a child's life is the most important. Because it's a, during the first seven years where they set the foundation for their personality. After the seven years, it's just renovation. So why not spend, give a portion of your remaining years to just looking after your grandchildren. Okay. So serve from your passion, vocation and live experience. It's important not always to do great things, but we can do small things with great love. And we do not need official position anymore. Okay, we do not want official position. But we want to serve. We want to be of use. Okay, and then here the breath. Okay, we want to talk about dementia. Okay. Okay, as you, as you, we have mentioned uh, last week, dementia are actually uh, are different types of, of uh, you have Alzheimer, baby body, a vascular, okay, frontal temporal, and others. Okay. Now, uh, what I want uh, I did, uh, you to do is to listen to an interview I conducted with uh, Mei Leung. Okay. This is, uh, Mei Leung is looking after people with dementia. So, uh, before that, uh, I just want to uh, share the 10 warning signs of the, uh, Alzheimer's, which is a form of dementia. Okay. You'll find that dementia is actually very hard to detect. Okay. It, can look, it can look like anything, uh, our normal one. Okay. Memory loss that disrupt daily life. Okay. They tend to forget very recent things, but they can remember things long ago. So they tend to forget whether they have breakfast or not, or lunch or not. They tend to forget their keys. But it doesn't mean that because they forget their keys, they are demented. But, okay? I mean, most of us forget our keys if you are stressed. So you have to see what is dementia and what is not. So, so memory loss that is applied. They have problems in planning or solving problems. Okay, challenges. So they cannot uh, make up a shopping list. Okay, or they cannot do complicated things. They have difficulty in completing familiar tasks. Okay. They used to be very good at uh, no, maybe uh, washing clothes using a washing machine, but after a while, they, they cannot do that. They don't know how to use the washing machine. Okay. And these are things, uh, usually it's very slow on set, maybe five to 10 years before people become aware that uh, the person is actually having problem. Okay. The, uh, confusion with time in place. Okay. I mean, my dad uh, passed away uh, three years ago by the age of 90. Okay. But sometimes when I visit him before he passed away, when he was in the, his 80s, he would wake up and say, oh, is it morning or night? No, totally disoriented, unable to place the thing. Trouble understanding visual images and spatial relationship. Okay. And uh, they can't, uh, they drive. If they drive, they can be very dangerous. Okay. My uh, dad, uh, before we uh, discovered that he has early dementia, used to drive. And he drive very fast. 
so much so that the maid beside him cry every time he drives. Okay. Until one day I decided to take away his, his car. The son uh, revoked the privilege of the father driving. New problems with words in speaking and writing. So sometimes uh, when we talk, and then he will forget a word, and then uh, he'll stop, and then he'll try to use another word. Misplacing things and losing the ability to retrace steps. Okay. Now before we discovered that he had that, he actually can he got get lost. Now he will go to uh, he likes to go out in the afternoon for afternoon tea. Then he will go to the same place, which is good. No? So he will visit the same shops. Then he will forget where is his home. But he's smart enough to go back to the same shop. Who knows him? Who, then who knows to call me? Okay, so so we find that uh, it can be very subtle, poor judgment, withdraw from, and then they become very withdraw from work and social activities. Okay, at one time he was very keen to go to church. Then after that he slowly said, "I don't want to go to church. I want to stay at home. I'm very peaceful at home." And there is often changes in moods and personality. Okay, I know that. If many of us looking at this 10 warning signs, we think that all of us fit all 10, so we are all having Alzheimer's. Okay, it's not true, okay? So we are not having Alzheimer's. Okay, but what I want to do is to share with an uh, 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 interview I did with uh, May, uh, Ta, May Leong of uh, uh, Hillview Aged Care Home in JB. It's a very interesting interview. Okay, if I can. This one. Hello. Uh, Hi. I'm so glad that you can join us as a part of this seminar to talk about uh, patients with dementia and Alzheimer. Okay. I want to introduce uh, Mei Leong. She is uh, taking care of, uh, she's in charge of uh, uh, Hillview uh, Aged Care Home in Johor Bahru. Would you like to tell us a bit, a bit about Hillview? Yes. Hillview is the place where, you know, um, for the elderly, our vision, our, our leaders' visions previously or initially was actually uh, to, uh, to look to for the, those uh, elderly with the uh, mobility, you know, something like for retirement age. Mm. But at the, end of, at the end of the day, we realized that it's just not about retirement because as you know that uh, for the Chinese, filial piety plays a very important role in our in our Chinese community. So as long as the children, only when they think they cannot, they are not able to look after their parents, then only they will think about aged care home. So when I first started this place, I realized that, gosh, those coming in are those with, uh, you know, they either they, are, they had a, uh, they have a, you know, uh, their, with their mobility, but then you realize that it's not only on mobility, but it's also, also on their mental status, you know, that is Alzheimer or dementia. And I was really, really very new about that, you know. But it really interests me when I realized that suddenly, you know, what made them to be like that, you know? And of course, um, on the medical perspective, you know, people are trying out to to, uh, to slow down this disease. But at the end of the day, if it's too much of medication, I realize that I will actually become a bit like a zombie. So, we try not to give them too much of medication unless they're not able to control their behavior. So, what I understand from the uh, dementia is all talking about managing their behavior. So how do we do this, you know, when uh, we start to uh, attend many seminars and trainings with all my nurses and our caregivers, we realize that it's all about human to human connections. You know, it's all about human to human connections. So it comes to um, interaction and we come with facial expression, tone, eye contact and touch. I realize that when, you know, so now when I have any new cases coming in, the first thing that I must do is to welcome them to this place. 
because they can actually when they see you they really tap you on your face on your face and they tap you on your facial expression and they tap you on your tone so when i say welcome auntie wow you look so gorgeous you look so pretty oh they can remember that that means they feel that they have a sense of belonging in this place oh you accept me as who i am so when i think about interaction you know I realize that many, many of us, or maybe caregivers to our loved ones with dementia, we lack of this interaction. Because we really always say like, you know, we like to say like, remember? Remember I told you that? Remember? And maybe we say something like, um, well, what a person of dementia they cannot remember. They definitely cannot remember. When you ask them, do you remember what you had for your breakfast? Don't you remember that you had a fall yesterday and I put you on a wheelchair? I can guarantee that they will get very upset. They will definitely get very upset. Because imagine, even for us too, we will get very upset because when we constantly keep reminding them, you know, this one and that one that you have to do, and they, they cannot remember, and they upset and we get upset. So, the only thing that I always remember when I say remember is only when I talk to them about their past distance. Back to 20 years ago, then I will use the word remember. Other than that, I'll do use the word remember. Yeah. So another thing that uh, I always try to uh, interact with them using the word can rather than I ask them to you. You know? So when I say, Auntie, can you help me with plucking on the vegetables? Rather than I say, do you want to pluck vegetables? Then they say, no. Why should I? I pay for this place. Uh -huh. You know? I pay, you know, why you want me to pluck the vegetable? You know? I do not want to dirty my fingers. They say, no, auntie. You know so many things. Can you help me? I cannot handle my own. You know, you're very good at it, you know? So when you use the word can, they feel like, wow, you need my help. Then they will come and do it for you. So you don't ask them. You actually involve them in. Okay, so, uh, okay, uh, you can actually watch the whole interview. This is only part of the interview. The whole interview here, okay, in this uh, YouTube. So you can, I'll give, I'll send the uh, uh PDF so you can actually link on and watch the whole interview. But it's very interesting what she says about how to deal with people with dementia. It's more of relationship, okay? More of relationship as we go on. Okay, so now, this uh, will be reminded that dementia is not normal aging, okay? Age, uh, not everybody get dementia, but one in 10 get dementia. But what is very important for us, especially as Christian, is faith and memory in dementia. Okay? Uh, in our daily life, uh, in dementia, learning and memory is uh, involved, uh, been involved. Language is involved. Executive function is involved. Complex attention, perceptual motor and connective social connection. Uh, connect connection okay? connection is is involved but if you remove our memory if you remove our language if we remove our executive function if we remove our complex attention okay how we pay attention to things if we remove our perceptual motto and our social connection Okay. If we remove all this, what happens to our faith? What happens to our faith in God? Okay. We know that God still knows us, but do we know God? Will we still have a relationship with God? Okay. I've been doing a lot of studies on this, and I come to the conclusion that yes, even though we, we have removed all these memories and all that, be down beneath all 
the the uh, functioning of the consciousness is our true self and our true self is still in connection with god and that is why it's so important to do the uh, spiritual discipline the spiritual discipline are spiritual habits that if you do it long enough become automatic habits that goes beyond our memories our functioning and all that to our being okay. i've heard of many cases of people who are uh, suffer from full blown dementia yet able to go to want to go to chapel and pray and read the bible and uh, you know the, the holding cross that i show you many of the uh, people who full blown dementia when in the uh, young younger days are, are very committed christians and when given the cross to hold they calm down they feel peace or given their favorite bible so i believe that you know even if dementia takes us we are still connected to god that is a word. but it's important that we build the correct habits okay and i just end by saying uh about dying okay an example is the jacob okay, I, i always like the way uh genesis 48 49 describe jacob's death at a time when he knows that he will die okay he calls all his children and one by one he blessed them one by one he blessed them and one by one he tells the history of God's goodness to their people to their family the time of the famine egypt and all that and then he says you know go forth and continue God's purpose for our family so a dying father and a dying son links the past with hope for the future and continues the way of life for his uh, 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 after that to fulfill God's purpose so so it means the the legacy he gave is to commission his sons to take over their mission for God their purpose to fulfill God's purpose so that is what a good death is okay what dying is okay what is a good death okay uh this study done shows that a good death means that you are in some sort of control okay you may not be in absolute control comfortable a sense of closure okay affirmation or value of the dying person recognized okay i think all of us want to be recognized as human being we just don't want to be a piece of meat okay we trust our caregiver and we recognize that they death is impending it's a very strange thing in our uh, asian culture i have a lot of parents coming to me when i was working in adults at the time and says oh don't tell my father or my mother that he's dying i mean uh, the person knows that he or she is dying she is very sick but the children will say don't tell my mother that he's dying don't tell my father that he's dying i felt that uh, you know you shouldn't lie to the person whether he's dying or not we honor the belief and values we try to minimize the burden and we optimize relationship especially with the loved one in the purpose of death leaving a legacy and family care so it's important that uh end of life what is an acceptable end of life care okay we just talk about good death end of life care is that we have to desire physical comfort okay shouldn't be in pain shouldn't be uh without dignity okay they have a person that's dying should have at least some con uh, decision about medical care and routines whether is necessary or whether the one person want to continue the treatment 
if the treatment is not effective. Okay, is the family's burden for advocacy for quality care? And that means uh, try to uh, act so that the doctors sometimes doctors talk in certain ways. So you need to understand how doctor what what they actually really mean. Yeah, I'm sorry. Sometimes doctors we use tend to use two technical terms which may be misinterpreted by the uh, patient. Educate the family to increase their knowledge and confidence. I think there's a very important role to educate the family and provide the family with emotional support before and after the patient's death. That means we have to be uh, providing emotional support. So a good death is a natural uh, uh, trajectory of faith commitments made earlier in life. As you once live, so you die. So death is part of the process of living. It's just that you have to go on to another phase. Okay? You might, may want to do some advanced planning, like a living view. And, you need, and very important, a good death that you must complete relationship, including that that needs reconciliation. In other words, you must have closure. Okay. And the most important words I find, the four most important sentences that people who are dying want to say is not, not, not uh, what your company has said and uh, what your company do. The four most important sentences they want to say is that, I love you. They want to say, thank you. They want to say, I forgive you. And they want to say, forgive me. And they want to, to meet the brothers and sisters they have not spoken to for 20, 30 years and say this to them. Forgive me. I love you. That is the closure. And that is the important part of a good death. So the good that comes after we cease clinging to things and the values of this world and increasingly embrace eternity. In other words, from a movement from uh, becoming, from uh, doing to being, from the false self to the true self. It comes to one whose spirit has been enriched by the difficulties of the end of life. So even the end of life, the pain and the suffering that comes with before death is part of the learning process, part of spiritual formation. Okay? And sometimes it's good to decide whether to, to say no to medical treatment. Okay? But you have to consider whether you want to say no or not, especially medical treatment that is not uh, effective. Okay? And a good death is peaceful. For the dying person knows that it is little resurrection, eternal life in God's presence. So that is the blessed hope. So the fall movement of aging well is doing to be from friend, from servant to friend, for self to true self, knowing to not knowing, becoming intimacy authenticity and trust and i'll end here so we will have some time for questions okay uh you're welcome to unmute your mics and ask questions uh, Dr. Alex Dunn, yes. what is your view uh, about this, um, uh, the uh, uh, scriptural view about burial and cremation? Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think the Bible uh, has any uh, prohibition or against uh, uh, cremation. 
Okay, so that means they uh, the actually the the scripture is silent on both. Mm. I mean, on burial and uh, cremation. So I think I guess it, we we have we have to use our mind and our tradition. Yeah, but there is no nothing against cremation. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Dr. Tang? Yes. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. I was just wondering, uh, maybe you can say something about sudden death. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, to, I mean, I'm working with some widows mm -hmm. and uh, it has been a very different journey for them. We talk yeah. about good death, we talk about closure, mm. but this is one area that I'd like to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I, I think uh, sudden death is uh, uh, very difficult uh, to walk alongside people because if you are old or if you have a, a terminal disease, then it's easy to accept because you, you, you know there's a process going or you have history of heart disease and all that. But sometimes death occurs suddenly, like accident or conorism. So, so it's very sudden. Everybody got caught by surprise. So there's no time to prepare. So, so the approach is usually to walk alongside them, you know, and, and help them in the grief process, like in every uh, uh, normal death. But they will have a lot of questions and a lot of angry questions. Okay, so basically is to, I, I think the most important in grief uh, management is to be there. Don't try to answer questions. Why God allowed this for this? Because I think we don't know the answer. Okay? Uh, so, so don't confuse the issue by, oh, you know, he's in a, uh, you know, don't say he's in a better place. You know, uh, God wants him more than you. Yeah. So this, uh, sometimes uh, as Christians, we do not know what to say to people who are grieving. So we tend to say all the wrong things. So it's better don't say anything at all, but just being there. Okay, look after their needs, especially the first few weeks because they are in shock. Okay, so make sure they eat, make sure they clean their house, make sure they take bath and all that. But just being there. Okay, I hope that's useful. Is that, is that, I hope you answered your question. Okay. They, they, they have many questions and I mm. guess it's uh, normal for them to just spill out all the angry questions which we don't have answers mm -hmm. uh, but it was sometimes it is their children or their wives who had no closure we, we, yeah. you're, you're talking about closure just now yes. right for the good yes, the good closure mm. so the husband died suddenly collapsed while they're watching the car mm. so the husband may not have closure with her mm. and she herself and the children have no closure with the husband so this um yeah, sometimes we talk about closure, it's closure with the living ones, it's harder. Because the husband don't need any closure, she's in the presence of God. But it is a totally different challenge. Yeah. So, so yeah. we have to add on the, the, the grief reaction, the guilt reaction. Yeah. Okay, a lot the of what? them, guilt. Yes, yes, guilty. yes. Ah, yes. Just yes. guilty. Yes. You know, what, uh, I, I say this to, to him or her before he died. You know, I, I didn't mean that, you know. So, so, so that means, aside from counseling for grief, you also counseling for guilt. Mm. Okay. Uh, we should have done this, we should have done that. You know, we should have mm. seen another doctor. You know, it's always, but then a lot of it is anger. Mm. So I think the best we can do is to listen patiently, try not to uh, give mm. uh, uh, answers that we do not know, but just be mm. there. I think, and I think that will be the most powerful way of helping them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you, Persis. Related That's a good question. Thank you. Related mm. question, Dr. Alex. Uh, basically, my question is, what do you think about the Catholic practice? Maybe it's Orthodox practice also, the, the Catholic practice of praying for the dead. Well, we, we, we uh, praying for the dead, I, I think that there's no harm in praying for the dead. Because, you know, uh, <clears throat> In a sense, they are, are still alive. Okay, we talk about the the hall of witnesses, uh, past time and all that. So they are with Jesus now, and then uh, when Jesus come again, they will have received the resurrection body and life. So in that sense, 
uh, I have no problem with uh, uh, praying for the dead. Okay, but I don't think the dead. Uh, when we pray for a dead, we pray. Uh, we remember them, but I don't uh, subscribe to the idea of praying for the dead so that they can help us or they can put in a good word for we God for us. Okay, so I think you have to differentiate between the two. Okay, that's more remembering like praying the to dead. the dead versus praying for yeah, the dead. Remember, uh, remembering the dead versus uh, uh, praying the dead as we pray to they, they pray to the saints. You know, they pray to the saints so that the saints will. You know, because they are saints, so they will be closer to God. So they will God they get God's ear. So I don't think that that will be the one. But you know, we, we do Ching Ming and then we do uh, what we remember our uh, the, uh, our uh, one who gone before. So I, I think it, it's good to maybe. Uh, I mean, they have this day of praying for the dead. But of course, we don't want to convert that to Halloween and all that. It's horrible. Dr. Ellis? Yes. Uh, is it okay? Uh, what is your opinion on keeping uh, parents earned in the house? Uh, it's not, I mean, again, I have, there's no theological or political against or for keeping the urn in the house. It's, it's, uh, you need to store it somewhere. You want to put in an urn or put it in a collaborum. Uh, okay. why, why do you ask the question? Is there anything that you need to clarify? <laughs> because uh, uh, my sister was asking me, mm -hmm. instead of putting a collaborum in a private uh, where they manage, uh, why don't we put it in our own house where it's so comfortably, especially when we have a, a nice cabinet, you know? Mm. And we can actually remember our parents wherever, mm. not only during the Qingming's times, mm. but in fact daily when we want to pray, mm -hmm. we can pray there and then we can put the flowers there. You know, yeah, I, it's I a that... gesture of thanksgiving and attitude of thanks to them. Yeah, I, I, I mean, it's a good idea to remember them. So I, I don't think uh, there's anything forbidding us from keeping the ashes around. Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome. Mm. Dr. Alex Tang. Yes. Um, I thought in the Bible it did mention from dust to dust. Mm -hmm. So, shouldn't it be from dust to dust? Uh, dust to dust means uh, we will de de uh, decompose into dust. It doesn't mean that we must be buried. Oh, I see. Okay. Like, there are some people who throw the ashes to the sea. Mm -hmm. That's not from dust to dust? Yeah. I, I think, as I said, uh, no, it, it, some cremation and all that. But we, we are actually not uh, linked to this body anymore. Okay? We will get a new body during the resurrection. So it can be thrown anywhere? Yeah, anywhere? you can keep it. Uh, you, can, you can be thrown in the sea. You know, A friend of mine has it scattered in a golf course. <laughs> So I don't think there's any uh, biblical injunction against what we do with the ashes. Is that, is that helpful? Uh, not too sure, but I think I'll follow from dust to dust. <laughs> okay, dust to dust is just uh, 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 descriptive. No? Okay. You come from dust, you return to the dust. Dr. Alex Tan, may I yes. ask? Um, just now you say you pray to your loved ones and they are still living because they are with God right now. So mm -hmm. what's the purpose of praying to God? Uh, praying to them. I thought we only we only pray to God. We don't pray to our dead loved ones. They are not uh, God. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I, I, uh, I differentiate between praying to the loved one uh, as uh, you no, know, asking them for favors or uh, adorating them like we pray to God, but we, we pray to loved one like we pray for uh, as a remembrance. As we remember them, we pray into them in our prayer. Okay, that's that's what I mean for we pray for uh, for them. Okay, rather than pray uh, pray for them, rather than pray 
to them. Right? It's not like praying to God. No, we don't pray to them. You say praying for them, not to them. La. Yeah, I mean praying yeah, pray for them. Yeah, we're thanking them for the memory. Yeah. For what all saints, we have all saints uh, day. Where yeah. we give the names of our this our loved one who died, we give the names to the pastor. So on the All Saints Day, he will read out all the names of the past, our father and mothers who died, and we, he give thanks to them. I yes. give thanks to God for them. Then at the same time, a uh, Qingming uh, period. So there's one way we Christian remember the loved ones by giving thanks to God for them, not praying yeah. to them as. Uh, so thank you. I mean. Uh, that's the point. The All Souls Day, All Saints Day, it is a version of uh, remembering the dead, okay, who have gone before, be, uh, uh, before us. But I don't think we are praying to them as we are praying to Jesus or to God. Thanks for the clarification. Yeah, thank you. Can I just ask one question, please? Yeah. Uh, many of our children, let's say, have migrated. And so we practice uh, cremation for our mm. parents. Knowing mm -hmm. that if we bury, not many of our ch children will come back and and remember them, so to speak. Okay, is there? Uh, is it? Is it considered as bad for us not to have a grave or a urn in the family as a an item to to for them to remember the forefather, so to speak? Is there any psychological or emotional uh, uh, affecting them? Uh, okay, that's, that's a very good question. Thank you. Uh, that is a very real question because as our uh, diaspora continues and our children all uh, spread all over the world, whether uh, it's necessary to have grave and uh, uh, ashes or columbarum. Well, Actually, uh, it's not really necessary. I mean, uh, usually uh, after uh, one generation, you know, your grandchildren may remember you, may, okay, uh, if they know you, but your great grandchildren will not remember you at all. So it's uh, so it's whether they will they they're coming back to visit a stranger. Okay, so so that is something to consider. Uh, that uh, we, uh, whether we want to be remembered okay, as a, a person which is a stranger or just part of the family uh, ancestors. Okay, so if we are uh, part of the ancestors, I mean, we have our identity in God and that is good enough for us. But if we want our family to remember us, okay, uh, Basically, only two generations will remember you. Okay, so so uh, if they are doing all all the uh, visit uh, Qingming and all that is make it out of respect or out of tradition, cultural tradition, rather than knowing who you are and what you do. Okay, so we here we have the cultural legacy, Chinese uh, heritage. We talk about ancestor worship. We face a lot of em emphasis on ancestors. Okay, so that is uh, our Chinese heritage. The Christian heritage is that we remember our uh, ancestors who are now with God. So we, 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 they're okay. We don't have to worry about them. Okay, so they are the cloud of witnesses that are waiting for us. So it's not farewell. Okay, we will meet them again. So I think that that is a, a different perspective altogether. So whether it's necessary for uh, a grave or not that, actually not really necessary. 
Okay, and some places you can't even get places to bury. Okay, and so so it's not really necessary if you think about it, because our generation and our our children will be overseas, and when they have children, when they come back, we are they are all, we are all strangers. So whether we are comfortable with that, if you're comfortable with that, then then get scattered uh, scattered to the the sea or golf course. Okay, so so you know then then there's no uh no no remembrance. Okay, so so uh my both my parents are cremated and then they we scatter the ashes to the sea. Okay, uh, it's both, we have a discussion about that, and uh, my father says that yeah, after three generations, nobody will know us anymore. So you know we don't want a memorial. And and I sort of agree with him that we you know, but we remember them in Christ. We know that they, that they are in, in Christ, and that one day we will meet them. So there is this thing of uh. Uh, going to meet them in the future, with versus the Chinese culture tradition of looking at the past, the ancestor worship component. Okay, is that helpful? Yes, that is very helpful. Thank you for your thoughts and your answer. Mm, I'm glad. Thank you. Okay, Dr. Dan, can mm -hmm. we add this to your PowerPoint notes, sir? Mm -hmm. Can we have access to your PowerPoint? Oh, of course, my notes. Yeah, uh, uh, Adeline, uh, I'll pass it to Adeline, and then uh, Adeline, uh, did, did you get my last week one? Yeah. Did you receive my last week one? The PowerPoint? No. No? No. 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 Adeline okay. didn't attach it in the email. Okay. <laughs> yeah, some of us do, sorry. Some of us yes. do get the PowerPoint. Okay. Yeah, I got it through WhatsApp. Uh, Adeline, are you here? Uh, yes. Ah, so uh, can, can, can we uh, make sure that... Uh, we apologies to all who did not receive. Actually, I realized my mistake and I resent a second email. And a number of you uh, feedback that it was caught in your spam folder. So for the second email, if you still have not received, please do WhatsApp me and I'll send it to you through WhatsApp. This faster. Thank you. Okay. Dr. Uh, Dr. Alex Tang, yes. uh, 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 I'd like to ask you a question. Uh, you see, uh, uh, mm -hmm. quite often we are face to face with people who are dying, right? Mm -hmm. Now, is there anything that we can do or say to help that person to have a good closure? Maybe you can give us some guidance as to what we should do. Uh, uh, the main, I think, people who are dying. And uh, are they in the hospital or the hospice or what? No, no, no. At home? They, they know this is the end of their life, maybe from old age. Okay. Or maybe uh, maybe some are sick. Mm -hmm. yeah. So is there anything that we can do to help them or not? Because many uh, times we do not know what to say to them. Yeah. But I, 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 I always believe that our major ministry to another person at the end of their life is the ministry of presence. Yeah, the ministry of presence, the ministry be there, okay, so that they do not die alone. I think the one of the most fearful things is to die alone. So the ministry of presence means you just be there. Okay, just talk to them. You don't have to give them counseling, don't have to, to just, just be there. And just uh, uh, be there and be present to the talk to the um, okay. Uh, so that will be the major thing, okay, uh, mm -hmm. for people who are dying. Okay. And I, I find that hospice care is very important. Hospice care is uh, where people who are dying to go and have a comfortable death, a place to die. And I always believe that the church should be. Uh, involved in hospice care. I mean, the church was uh, involved in hospice care during the Middle Ages. Okay, from the uh, 15th to the 18th century, hospice are uh, actually run by churches. But after the Reformation, uh, very few of the Protestant churches are, run, are running hospice. I think there's something that our churches should pick up 
as a ministry. Okay, as a ministry to to walk with people who are dying so that they don't die alone and they die don't die in fear. Mm. Dr. Tang, last question from me. Thank sure. you so much for the sharing. Wonderful. I'm just wondering the four types of prayer that you mentioned. Mm. Uh, uh, can you give an example of the aesthetic prayer? You know, aware okay. of the aware of the unknowable God. I mean, that mm. part is quite blurred to me. I mean, it's unknown. I mean, it's not so it's not often taught and preached. So yeah. what, can you give me an example of that? Okay. Uh, one example is uh, uh, recorded by Teresa Avila in the she's, uh, 16th, 16th century uh, Spanish ascetic. Okay, Teresa Avila. Uh, she described her, her uh, ascetic prayer is that when she's praying, she felt as if they were, uh, God sent a spear that is burning. A burning spear that pierces her heart. Okay, so that she she feel the 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 ecstasy of being on fire with God. So that that's a uh, 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 Teresa of Avila's uh, description. Saint John of the Cross, also a contemporary but younger, talks about uh, the flaming fires of love. Okay, it sounds like love as uh, being part of his God is like a log that is burning. Initially, the, the outer layer of the bark gets burns off. And then the inner layer catch fires. Okay, so he felt that in this sort of prayer, he, he feels that the log, he is the log, that the fire of God sort of engulf him. So that he really feel the presence of God. Okay, so that's aesthetic prayer. Okay, it is uh, uh, we are it's not very, we are not very familiar with it. Okay, so thank you mm. for asking. Okay, but mm. it is it's a form of prayer that God allows people to experience. You know, it's a very powerful encounter of, of God. I guess not for everyone, or uh, is this something? Also speaking in tongues, that they will describe that. No, not speaking in tongues. No. Uh, speaking in tongues is, uh, I mean, speaking in tongues, they they are uh, uh, prayer. Okay, there's mm. more of a contemplative, but ecstasy is really feeling the. It's like a union with God like that. Okay, mm. so that is the the uh, and it, uh, uh, most of the spiritual master says that it's not for everybody. Mm. Not everybody will experience it. I mean, like all prayers is the grace of God. Mm. Okay, but usually those are people who are, are really, really deeply into prayer. Okay, mm. uh, Teresa of Avila is uh, considered one of the 36 uh, teachers of the church. Okay, and mm. her specialty is uh, prayer. Okay, so, mm. so, so that is something that we need to learn from. Mm. Yeah, but as I said, the four quadrant is very interesting. We are we are only focused yeah. on the verbal, but we can learn mm. about meditative prayer. We can learn about mm. contemplative prayer, and we can learn about mm. aesthetic prayer. There's so much more for us to explore, and experience. Where will the vision comes in? Where people claim that they see visions and dreams? Well, uh, visions and dreams come from God. No, I mean, which uh, world, uh, or it can occur in any uh, quadrant, in any, in any oh, of these four. Can, uh, it, I mean, even without uh, uh, not praying or so, you can. Yeah, okay. But it can occur in any quadrant, yes. Let's go ahead Thank and you. close this session. Thank you so much, Dr. Alex, for uh, sharing with us uh, your insights and, and answering the questions. And Oh, what a blessing. Just uh, to answer some of the questions, so we will we do plan to share the notes as well as the recording should be made available from both sessions. So let's go ahead and uh, close with a word of prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for blessing us with.
Dr. Alex and his years of experience and learning and reflecting on what it means to age, what it means to continue to grow and learn, what it means even to, to face the sunset years and die or walk with others who are in, in those uh, periods. Lord, help us to be more a reflection of Jesus in these stages ourselves and when we walk with others as well. We want to bring blessing in all of our stages of life. Please uh, help us remember the things that you want us to remember and particularly apply in our lives. We ask that you'd bless Dr. Alex and his ministry and all of us as we leave this session. Thank you. In Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Yeah. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you. 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 Thank you.